Hi everyone, my name is Adam Carmi and I'm the co-founder and VP R&D of Puppy Tools. We're a company that provides a cloud service for automated visual testing. As part of my work, I get to meet a lot of developers and testers and I'm always curious to learn how they do visual testing. Now, the two most common answers that I get is that uh, one, they have no idea what visual testing is and that two, they think I'm asking them whether or not they're using Sikuli. So, the main thing I hope you'll take away from this session is that you understand what visual testing is and that you can and should automate your visual tests. But if in addition you'll remember that uh, Sikuli is not a visual test automation tool and tell that to everyone you know, that would be awesome. So we have a lot, of, a lot to cover in today's session. Uh, first, um, I'll explain what visual testing is and why it should be automated. Then we'll look at the different tools that are available, how they work, and the technology that they're based on. And we'll conclude the session by explaining how automated visual testing can fit in your development or QA life cycle. Of course, there will be time at the end to answer any question that, that you may have, but especially in this forum, feel free to stop me at any point if anything is unclear. Okay. So what is visual testing? It is a quality assurance activity that is aimed to verify that a graphical user interface appears correctly to the end user. Now this goes beyond the traditional functional testing that you're used to do with tools like Selenium and others called the DUI, UFT, Appium, etc., where the focus is to test the functionality of the application through the UI. What we are focusing on here is making sure that the UI itself appears correctly, that each UI element appears in the right color, shape, position, and size, that it doesn't overlap or hide any other UI element. Now this type of testing has become increasingly difficult to perform in recent years, mainly because of the explosion in the number of, in the amount of execution environments, browsers, devices, operating systems, screen resolutions that applications are expected to run on. So here you can see um, an example of a visual bug that we found in the Microsoft Azure management portal. You can see here how the graph exceeded the expected bounds of the page. This is an example from Twitter. You can see how the notification timestamp overflowed on top of the notification that's below it, over here. Um, this is from the Financial Times. Here, uh, the article title uh, overflowed on top of the article body. And this is how the Amazon website looked like for se several hours for certain users on Amazon Prime Day, which was a huge sales day about six months ago. So I'm sure that you've all uh, seen these type of bugs before, hopefully not at your workplace, but I'm sure that you've seen them. You understand their severity, they can be very embarrassing, they can hurt the company brand, but in many situations they can completely cripple a website or application and end up costing a lot of money, as probably happened in this case. So why should we bother automating this type of testing? How do, Anyway, we, we've been managing without automation and been testing this stuff manually for uh, 30 years now, right? So there are many uh, reasons, but the most important one is that the test metrics is just too big to cover manually. Think of all the different web browsers and devices and operating system and screen resolutions. We all know that if a site looks good on IE, doesn't mean that it would look good on Chrome, right? And if an application looks good on a widescreen, doesn't mean that it would look good on a, on a smartphone. So we have to test across all these different environments and doing it manually takes a lot of time and money and it's also error prone. If your application or website is responsive, and most modern uh, websites are, then you also need to factor in the different layout modes and test them across all these environments. If it's localized to several languages, then each language has its own fonts and images and resources and content and all of these affect the UI, so you have to test all of these across all these different environments. And the truth is that even if we don't change a line of code in our product, we still depend on third-party upgrades. The most natural one for websites is the browser itself. It updates every couple of weeks, right? And whenever that happens, it can introduce incompatibilities with our site. So even if we didn't change anything, it could still break in certain areas, right? So we have to test all the time. We can't really focus our tests on just specific areas. And it's just impossible to do manually. When it comes to mobile applications, um, quality is e even more critical. Um, the fact is that it's much harder to roll back changes, unlike websites when you can just fix the bug and, and uh, push it to production. Uh, you can push daily to the App Store, and even if you find a way to 
to work around that, then frequent updates uh, take battery and data and eventually upset your customers. And even with that, customers are not uh, forced to get your upgrades. So they can just decide not to upgrade and be, stay with your bug forever, right? And in general, there's a much higher quality bar when it comes to mobile uh, applications simply because mobile users are much less tolerant to UI and Unix bugs. In addition, release cycles keep getting shorter and shorter. Like companies that are practicing continuous deployment, which is the recent, the current hype, let's say, are releasing code to production several times a day. And with such short release cycles, there's hardly any time to do any type of manual testing, let alone making sure that the UI looks right in such a huge amount of environments. So let's talk a little bit about the tools and the technology. Um, there are over 30 um, visual test automation tools out there today. Uh, and they all share the same simple workflow that have, has four steps. In the first step, you drive the application on the test and get screenshots. In the second step, the tool takes those screenshots and compares them with baseline images. These baseline images define the expected appearance of the, of the application in that point in the test. In the majority of cases, these are simply screenshots that were taken in the past, in previous test runs, and were approved by a manual tester who looked at them and made sure that they are correct. In the third step, the tool takes the results of these comparisons takes the screenshots and the baseline images and generates a report, which includes all the differences that were found, if any. And in the fourth step, a human tester has to look at the report and decide for each change whether it is a bug, in which case he opens a bug, or if it is a valid change because he just added a feature or fixed a bug or something, then he simply approves the new screenshots so they would be used as baseline images for subsequent runs. So now it's time for our first demo, and I'll show you WebDriver CSS, which is an open source uh, visual test automation tool that uh, adds visual validation to, the, to WebDriver IO, which is one of the popular uh, JavaScript language, uh, uh, language bindings for WebDriver. Okay. So I know that the internet connection is not very good, so I hope that uh, it will run smoothly, but if not, I'll just show you the outcome and you'll have to take my word that it will, that it actually uh, does what I'm saying that it does. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with WebDriver.io, it's very simple. Um, let's just take a look at a very uh, trivial uh, piece of code that uses it. We created an instance of the driver and we indicate that we want to start a local Chrome browser. In this test, we start by opening up the driver, uh, the browser, sorry, then navigating to github.com, and we just wait 10 seconds. Very simple, it doesn't really test anything, it just automates the browser, but we can run it and see what we get. Okay, so we have github.com opening up. You can see the uh, sign up button that will relate to next and the fact that we also have a scroll bar, meaning that there is more content for the page that we cannot see on the screen right now. Okay, so we are waiting those 10 seconds and uh, the browser closed as we expected. Now let's add visual validation checkpoint to our test and we'll do that with WebDriver CSS and we just add these few lines here that initialize WebDriver CSS and also indicate to it that we would like to test this website, github.com, in two different widths. Um, the reason we do it is that the width of the browser is, is the primary factor that determines the layout of most responsive websites, and in particular of github.com. So by specifying those screen widths that we are interested in, we can actually force github.com to assume all these different layout modes so we can test it in all of them, okay, and make sure that it appears right in all of them. Once we've done that, uh, right after we are um, navigating to github.com, we add our visual validation point, uh, which is called WebDriver CSS. We provide a name for this checkpoint. In this case, it is GitHub. And we provide a list of elements on that page, on github.com, that we want to test. So in this case, we want to test the body element, which is the entire page, okay? And we also give it a name. In this case, it's home page. Okay, so let's run this test and see what we get. Okay, so we started, the browser started. 
it did the first resize. Now we did the second resize, taking screenshot as we discussed in the workflow, and we're done. Now if we go to the folder where I just ran the test, you can see that I have two new images. Um, the first one uh, shows us that it's the GitHub checkpoint for the homepage element for 400 pixels and with a suffix baseline. So because this is the first time I ran the test and I still don't have anything to compare with, so the first run actually set the baseline. Starting from the second run on onwards, I always have something to compare against. If we open this uh, image, you can see that it actually consists of the entire page, even the parts that are below uh, the viewport, below the font. Now, those of you who work with Chrome know that you cannot just get a uh, screenshot of the entire thing. You only get the viewport, right? So what WebDriver CSS did is that it actually took multiple screenshots and sc while scrolling the page and produced a full page screenshot for us, which is great because we get much more coverage. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're, we're going to simulate a bug on that page and see how WebDriver CSS captures it. And the way that we're going to do it is that we are going to execute some JavaScript just before the validation point and we'll locate the sign up button, okay, and we'll just change its visibility to hidden. Basically, we'll hide the sign up button. Okay, so let's run this test and see what we get. Okay, first resize and no button. Okay. Second resize without a button. And we are done. If we look back at our folder, you can see that we have two new images uh, with a regression suffix. This is WebDriver CSS way of telling us that it found a regression in, in the test. If we look at the regression image, we can see that it's the same image only without the button, just like this is the change that we did. But in addition, we also have a diff folder that now shows us um, a screenshot of the new image, of the regression image, with all the differing pixels painted in pink, which is a very nice way to report the change and visually see it, okay? So uh, what I wanted to take away from this example is how easy it is to take your existing uh, web driver or Selenium test and with just a few lines of code, enhance them so they would also be able to capture visual differences and save a lot of work for the manual testers that need to go and they can concentrate their efforts on other things that human beings need to think and do rather than just look at screens. Of course, it is also possible to tie um, uh, the results of the comparison directly into the test so that it would fail the test so we don't have to look at the folders and see if there are images there or not but uh, we don't have time to cover these settings, uh, so we'll skip that for now. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is to go over each of the steps of the workflow in detail, and I'll start with the second step of comparing screenshot. The reason I'm doing it is that I'm sure that you're all thinking about right now how stable is this image comparison, it's probably very flaky and unstable, I cannot rely on it, so let's get it out of the way and we can continue with the remainder of the step. So if you allow me to quote Boromir from Love of the, of the Rings, one does not simply do bitmap comparison. And by bitmap comparison, I'm talking about pixel to pixel comparison. The reason is that if you do that, you'll get a lot of false positives and you'll end up hating the tool and throwing it away. Okay. False positive in the sense of, uh, in the context of visual testing is a case where the tool tells you that there is a difference, but you cannot see it as a human being or it's too small, you don't care about it. Um, and there are many, many, many reasons for these uh, false positives to happen if you're that just doing dumb pixel to pixel comparison. And now let's go over a few of the more common ones so you'll have a better uh, clear picture about what I'm talking about. The first reason is an image processing effect that is called anti-aliasing. Maybe you've heard about the term. But what is it in, in reality? So we have here a navigation bar and on it we have uh, the playlist tab. And you can see the playlist tab magnified here at the center of the, of the uh, slide. Now you can see that the playlist tab here at the bottom appears to be white. And if you'd look at the DOM for that web page, it would say that the color is white. But if you, if you look at the rendered pixels, you can see that many of them are not white. There are many shades of blue, right? 
So uh, these pixels are actually, actually uh, anti-aliasing pixels that were added by the rendering engine, such as the uh, graphics card. And uh, the purpose of these pixels is basically to make the font looks, look nicer and more beautiful and smoother to the human eye. But we cannot see any of it. We don't see those blue uh, pixels here. This is a very good thing. It is used for decades now in computer science, right? But what's the problem with it when we're doing visual validation? The problem is that if you are running your test on more than one machine, which makes sense if you have more than one tester or if you're running in a test lab, then it's likely that you have a different machine that is running the same test. And if you have a different machine, it might have a different graphics card. It might have a different uh, settings for the graphics card. It might have a different screen connected to it, or maybe even the same thing, just a different version of the graphics driver. All of these factors could end up with having a different implementation of the anti-aliasing <laughs> algorithm, right? And when that happens, you simply get different pixels, okay? So if we look at the same page exactly rendered on a different computer, okay, you can see that the anti-aliasing pixels are quite different. Here they are blue, here they are in purple and pink, but down here, the original image, we cannot see the difference because basically the algorithm produces the same effect of making the font look nice to us. So then again, you can see if I toggle between the two how different the pixels are, the, p the differences are significant. If you're just doing pixel to pixel comparison, this will fail, this will fail your test for nothing, right? It's not a bug. And so you really need a sophisticated image matching uh, algorithm, image matching engine that will be able to understand that these are anti-aliasing pixels, it's okay for them to be different, that a human being cannot see the difference and they should be ignored and rather than failing your test. Here's another example that involves a moving element. Who recognizes the, we the, the website that this fragment is taken from? Dropbox, right, exactly. So in Dropbox, we have this upgrade account element that is moving. The reason that it's moving is because to the right of it, there's a username. And whenever we run the test, it's a different username. And so the upgrade account element is moving depending on the length of that username. But we would still like to validate uh, this page. So we have a moving element. So one idea that we can come up with is just instead of checking the whole page, let's just take a screenshot of the div or element that contains average account and just compare that screenshot with the screenshot in the baseline that is the same. And then it doesn't matter where it appears on the page. It's an excellent idea, but, but it would still not work because if we do that and place average account one on top of the other in those two screenshots, you can see that actually it looks that upgrade account is moving as a whole. But what the browser is actually doing, it is positioning every specific character in the text individually. So you can see that the uh, characters A, C, and O here are actually positioned in different pixels. So it's impossible to see that in the upgrade account uh, original example, but if you look at the pixels, that's what you'll see. And then again, you need a sophisticated image matching algorithm to be able to detect and ignore this difference because it's invisible to the human eye. The last example I want to show you has to do with image scaling. It's very common. Any image that you have on your website or application uh, has uh, an image that is displayed there, every image element, right? Whenever there is uh, the size of the source image is different than that of the target element, then uh, the uh, rendering engine has to fit it so it would have to scale it so it would fit the target bounds, right? And then again, two different computers, you get a different scaling uh, algorithm, implementation of it, right? So if we look at this rectangle here at the roof of the car, and we see the pixels that it contains, and we look at the rendering on another, uh, uh, by another computer, you can see how different the pixels can be. And then again, and the original image is completely invisible to us as humans, but the, the, the change in pixels is quite so substantial. And again, you need a, a smart algorithm to be able to detect and ignore it. So there are other reasons, other reasons that make this difficult. So first of all, you have arbitrary one pixel offsets in element positioning. This could be just elements that are placed one pixel to the side or downwards, or even a HTML table that uh, has a column that gets to be one pixel wider and moves everything else on the page. You need to be able to handle dynamic content like uh, dates and uh, usernames and banners and commercials. Uh, there are moving elements like the Abret account example that we've seen or animations. And you also be able to be able to uh, compare images of different sizes. 
And of course, it has to run super fast, otherwise your test will take forever to run. And in addition to that, there are those that always get uh, false positives no matter what they do. But seriously, uh, the reason I'm showing you all of this is just to, sh to explain why if you ever tried just comparing pixel and it didn't work, why it doesn't work. And also to say that in recent years, the visual test automation tools have come a very long way in handling these issues and allowing you to really perform uh, visual test automation at a very large scale in a very stable way. So let's go over these image comparison engines uh, in more detail and see what are the uh, primary ones that all these tools are based on. Uh, the first is Image Magic. Um, it's a very powerful command line tool for doing general purpose uh, image processing uh, um, algorithms such as taking an image and scaling it and rotating it or changing it to grayscale or changing the format in which it is saved. And one of the other things that it does, it allows you to compare two images. It also provides a fuzzing feature that allows you to overcome some of the false positives that I just mentioned. Um, the way that it works is that you just, in the command line, you simply call compare, provide the first image and the second image, and it would produce uh, the number of uh, pixels that are different between those images. But in addition, if you provide a third image, it will uh, store an image of the second image with all the different pixels painted in pink, just like we saw with WebDriver CSS. The tools that are based on image magic rely on an error ratio to decide if the two images are matching. And how is that done? Uh, the tools take the number of different pixels that we have here and divide that in the area of the image. And this provides an error ratio. Now, within the test, you can decide what is the threshold of error that you are willing to accept as uh, a match, right? So you can decide that as long as the error does not exceed uh, half a percent of uh, half a percent, then your test will pass. Otherwise, it will fail. Okay. Next, we have the three JavaScript engine: ResembleJS, BlinkDiff, and LookSame. Uh, they're implemented in JavaScript, also based on a pixel-to-pixel -pixel comparison, just like Image uh, Magic. They are also the tools that rely on them use an error ratio to determine a match versus a mismatch. But they also have better abilities to handle some of these false positives that I've described. So for instance, ResembleJS has very good treatment for anti-aliasing um, pixels. Uh, BlinkDiff does a good job with um, taking into account the fact that we as humans are less sensitive to color changes in some color ranges than, than others, so they're more uh, tolerant to, uh, to differences uh, in colors. Uh, and these tools do a very good job, and there are many, many tools that are based on them. And this leads us to the third and to the third uh, matching engine, which is our own API Tools Eyes engine that we've been developing for several years now, exactly to solve this problem. And it handles all of these uh, issues uh, that I've shown you and many others very well. Can handle dynamic and moving content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The two most important things that are um, that distinguish it from the rest is that first of all, it does not rely on an error ratio. So the idea here is it really simulates the human sight and it will only show differences that a human can see and it has nothing to do with the size of the difference or the size of the area of the image. So just to give an, an example, so if you have a very large web page like we've seen in the demo before, if a comma would change to a period or a plus would change to a minus, which is just a few pixel difference, uh, the tool would highlight that as a difference because it's a very important one. On the other hand, if you have a table on your uh, website and one of the columns would be one pixel wider and that would move the rest, would shift the rest of the image to the side and create an 80% difference, still we cannot see that as humans, right? The fact that, that the column became one pixel wider and the tool is smart enough to understand that a human cannot see it and it will just ignore that, that uh, difference. The second uh, di uh, uh, thing that is special about it, it, it is capable of performing structural or layout uh, comparison of images. And this is very useful and I'll show you uh, how it works with Apply Tools Eyes. So in this example, uh, we have the Paychex website. We have on the left-hand side uh, the baseline image. 
and you can see that it was taken on Chrome. And on the right hand side, we have the current image or the image that we're validating that was taken on IE. And if I toggle between the two, you can see how different uh, the two browsers render the same page. Uh, we have uh, slightly different fonts, the position is slightly different. Uh, uh, you can see that the text in this paragraph scrolls, dif uh, wraps differently, the, the scroll bar is different. But all of this is okay. I mean, browsers are different and it's okay for them to, to uh, render differently. But still, structurally, the web pages are consistent. And because of that, all these differences are not highlighted. If I would click this radar button over here, you can see that it does highlight a change. And if I zoom into it, you can see that it did pick up that on IE we have a, a missing element. So this is one example of how powerful structural matching is in the sense that it allows you to have a single baseline image from one environment and use it to verify uh, screenshots from many other environments. Okay. Let's take a look at another example. Um, this one is from Twitter. A baseline on Samsung S4 and a uh, current image from Samsung S5 and we have uh, several violations here. We can see that according to the baseline, the first tweet should be aligned to the right of the image, and this is being violated over here. The second thing is that uh, the, tweet, uh, the, uh, the last tweet should have an image next to it, but it's missing over here, right? All these issues are correctly captured. On the other hand, if you look at it, these two tweets in the middle, you can see that although they have different images and different text in them, still they are structurally equivalent, and therefore they are not marked as different. And this leads us to the second very uh, uh, valuable use of uh, layout matching, which is actually uh, validating extremely dynamic applications. So in this case, we have the Yahoo website where the baseline and current images were taken in a 24 hour difference, okay? So you can see that although the images are very different and the articles are very different, still structurally they're equivalent and therefore um, uh, the test passed, okay? You can actually monitor production system this way. If I would change this to a more strict match, you can see that all the dynamic parts are highlighted in pink, as you would expect, and the static ones aren't, aren't like this navigation bar. However, if I would change this to exact pixel to pixel matching, you can see that the entire page is highlighted simply because all the pixels are indeed different only that uh, strict match algorithm was smart enough to detect those differences that a human cannot see and ignore them. Any questions about comparison of images before we move on? Yes. Yes. You can compare parts, you can co compare the whole thing, you have full control of that. Yes. Yeah, so now we will see how you can you can do that. Okay. Yes. Um, so as you saw with WebDriver CSS, it gave you the whole page. Um, different tools, don't all of them have the same capability. Some will only give you the viewport. Um, if you're asking specifically about Apply Tools Eyes, that you can decide which one you want. So uh, we use, Specific, specifically for Apply Tools, all it cares about is an image. It doesn't care where it came from. We have different SDKs that connect into different systems. So when we're working with Selenium, we ask the web driver for the image or set of images in order to create a full page screenshot. When we're working with uh, UFT, we ask UFT for the screenshot. But once we get it, we do the validation. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Yes, yes you can. It's just images, so basically if you have two images, you can compare them. It doesn't care where the images came from. If you draw them in Photoshop or rendered by a browser, it's the same. Yes. Yes. You can control it, 
uh, the way that you want to do it, but uh, specifically if you want to do cross device or cross browser, then the, the full answer is that you need to have a single baseline for every layout mode of your application. So if you have like, it doesn't make sense to compare a small uh, smartphone with a tablet, right? So different layout entirely for the, for the application. So you'll have one for small phones, one for tablets, but you don't need for each and every tablet to have its own. Sorry. If so, yeah, yeah. So specifically for the layout algorithm, it allows for various images. So if the image will be gone, it will say that it's missing. But if it's another image, then we cannot say if it's broken or not. So no, because it cannot tell if it's uh, just an image of something else or this image broken. A human has to look at that and decide. Okay, so now that we understand how we compare images, how the different tools compare the images, and I hope that you have more confidence that it can work and you can scale your test with it because you can. Okay. So let's talk about how the different tools handle getting those screenshots and driving the application of the test. So as I mentioned, um, although all these different visual test automation tools share the same, uh, the same workflow, we can still categorize them roughly in two categories. The first is the quick feedback tools. They share a similar setup where the tool renders the screenshots with a headless browser, such as PhantomJS and Slimer.js. And the, the tests are driven by a configuration file. Usually this configuration file will consist of a list of URLs that the tool will visit and render the screenshot and validate, okay? The motivation for using this uh, type, this category of tools is to get fast, fast feedback on code changes. Usually it would be the front-end developers. When a front-end developer changes a component or a page and he wants to make sure that the changes that he did didn't uh, didn't uh, spoil other parts, other components or other parts of the application. He would use those tools, they run in the background, they don't pop up browsers because it's a headless browser and because it's a configuration file then uh, it, you don't need to deal with maintenance and building tests and learning new languages or technologies. It's very simple and easy and effective. The downsides of it is that it provides you with very partial coverage. First of all, if you're working with PhantomJS and Slimer.js, you're only covered with Firefox and Safari. You don't cover IE and Chrome, which are quite significant and important browsers. The second thing, even for PhantomJS and, Slim and Slimer.js, you're using old versions of those browsers because uh, browsers update every two weeks, these guys update every few months, and you don't necessarily have the latest version. So it's possible that your test will pass, but still you have a bug on the new and real browser. And of course, because you're using a configuration file to drive your test, you're limited in the navigation, that in the interactions that you can simulate. So you cannot really get to states of your UI when you need to fill out forms and click buttons and hover over ele elements. You cannot do it with the configuration file. On the other hand, the other category of tool does allow you to verify everything, right? And usually the setup would be to really render screenshots on real browsers and real operating systems, to run a lot of tests and do that in parallel. And not surprisingly, those set of tools will be based on a web driver and a Selenium grid to accomplish that. And the tests themselves will be based on a web driver or some DSL on top of that. The motivation here is really to mainly for uh, test automation team, for QA teams that really want to make sure automatically that the UI looks good uh, on all the real execution environments and they want to you want to really test all the different states and you want to have many st uh, tests and run them in parallel in order to speed things up. The disadvantages of this approach is that it does require you to invest in some test infrastructure, setting up a grid, uh, running tests in parallel, and of course you need to maintain um, a test code, right? But on the other hand, for professional uh, test automation teams, you already have those environments in place and you have the expertise to implement and maintain the test so it's not really a disadvantage to add these tools. On this slide, you can see a list of uh, some of the Selenium tools that are available. Um, first of all, you can see that the majority of them are code-based rather than configuration-based. You can see that for 
almost for every language binding, there is a visual test automation tool that can be used to augment it. And the third thing to notice is that uh, none of these tools would work with native uh, uh, applications, only for uh, web applications, except for Appli Tools Eyes that can verify any application that Appli Loom cannot automate. Okay, let's move to the third step, reporting differences. So many of the tools simply report the differences as files on the file system, just like we saw with, with Web Driver CSS. You have the baseline image and the regression or current image and then the diff image. Now this seems like a simplistic way of reporting, but it's actually very effective because files are very easy to handle. You can easily send them for someone to review. You can commit them to in your source control and keep a history of those baseline and the changes. So it's quite a, a good way to report this kind of uh, results. There are other tools like the Selenium Visual Diff that provides you with a nicer dashboard where you have like statistics about the runs and what failed and how many differences were found and nice thumbprints of the failures uh, that you can drill down and see up close. And when it comes to updating the baseline, then all of the tools that are based on the file system will usually have a command line tool that allow you to say that you are accepting a baseline and then it will handle all the renames and moving the, the images to the right directories, etc. Some other tools like Gemini will provide you with a nicer UI when you can actually see the, clearly the difference and click a button to replace the baseline image with the current image. But then again, when it comes to visual testing, there are situations where even a single change or a single bug can fail many, many of your tests. So just to take a, an a extreme example, if you just change the header of your, of your application, um, and uh, that's failed every test, every image in your that you have in your test because all of them include the header, just as an example. So because of that, and you don't really want to look at a thousand images of the same change in the header and accept and accept and accept or reject if it's a bug. So all of the tools provide you with a mechanism to override the baseline, which means just, I don't want to look at it, just accept all the new images in the new baseline and that's it. But this is a very risky thing to do because among these images, there might be bugs that you just approved. And once you do that, they become part of the baseline. And then the tool won't be able to tell you that, that they are there, right? What you would really want to do is be able to look just on the unique differences and not on all their occurrences, right? And this is part of what is called automated maintenance. And I'll show you how that's accomplished with Applitude's eyes. So in this case, we take the GitHub example a step forward. Let's say that we've built a suite of tests for GitHub. We have many, many tests. All of them failed. Uh, we covered four different execution environments, different browsers, different devices, different form factors, and in total, we had 76 mismatches. Now, although it is very easy to see the thumbprints of the dif differences, see that it's a uh, change in the header, zoom into it very quickly, and uh, see that uh, indeed the GitHub logo went away and decided it's a bug and reject it. Very easy to go and then continue to reject all the differences that have the same change that we can see directly here. Still, if you have a thousands of these, this could be a bit uh, overwhelming, let's say. So you can actually ask the tool to group those differences together. And then once you did that, you're only left with two images to look at, right? And then you can quickly inspect the first one see that uh, the GitHub logo went away, that's a bug, we didn't want it to happen, and by that you're done maintaining all those images that have the same difference. Although there's different pages on different browsers, it doesn't matter. And then look at the other one and see that, in this case, actually the GitHub uh, logo changed color to green, which is what we intended to do, and accept that, and by that we're done maintaining, we could just save the entire batch and we're, by two few clicks, we're done maintaining the whole thing. Okay, and there's a lot of features like that that really allow you to scale up your test. And today we have customers that are running thousands of tests every day with very little maintenance overhead uh, because of these abilities. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how all of this fits in the development life cycle. Um, the quick answer is that it fits in all stages. When we talk about unit testing, we also already talked about how 
uh, front-end developers can use it as a visual unit test to make sure that the components that they build don't break when they change code. Easy to send to code review, easy to share. Uh, at the integration uh, testing level, we've seen how, with WebDriver CSS how easy it is to take your end-to-end -end test, your existing tests, and just add visual validation points to them with just a few lines of code. When you do that, you get an extra uh, bonus that the tool becomes a very powerful collaboration tool within the team because all of a sudden you have a, a dashboard where all the changes are documented and everyone can see them. So if you have a developer that added a feature, added a new button, then 10 minutes later when the automated test kicked in, everyone in the team can see that change and immediately provide feedback. And, by, and there what you get is that you drastically reduce the feedback loop within the team, which is of course the goal of every Agile team, to reduce that feedback. As far as acceptance testing goes, it's very common to take a release candidate that's about to be released and get screenshots from it, from, from it and compare it with the baseline of the previous release. This way you can see what changed and make sure that there are no unexpected changes before you release. So you can validate the staging environment with respect to the production environment, etc. And of course, there are many teams that are doing visual testing in production. Um, they, you can find that there are no missing resources on your production server. You can make sure that there are no corruption due to third-party upgrades if the browser that upgraded or some component or maybe you're consuming data from a third party and want to make sure that it continues to arrive and nothing is broken uh, in your test. And um, with this, I conclude the session. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yep. Excellent question. Yeah. Yes, excellent question. The question was, how does this approach compare with the Galen framework? So the Galen framework, uh, I don't know if everyone is familiar with it, is one, is one where you need to create a spec in code, a text file that is a specification of the page, and then it can be able to, it is able to check uh, according to uh, the structure of the DOM whether it is consistent with the specification. So the problem here is at least as I see it, is that first of all, who wants to write a spec and maintain it? It takes time, you, you can make mistake in the spec, and just imagine with all the work that you have today to add another task, that whenever you have a change, you need to go and update the spec for this to happen. The second difference is that it doesn't really test what the browser is showing the user, it tests what the browser is supposed to show the user. So it's perfectly natural for the DOM to be in a certain way, but there's a bug in the browser in the new release that it doesn't look the same as you would expect it to look. Maybe the element is there, but the, the foreground is white and the background is white, so it's transparent. It's there in the DOM, but it's not vi visible over there. So there are, there are differences. It's a very nice framework, it's a very nice approach, but a different one. And from my experience, from being, from what, from being having to test these algorithms, I know how hard it is to, when you have like, you did a change, and all of a sudden you have 50 failures that are just text changes. And then you look at the diffs and you see that the number 45 changed to 43 and you have no idea what it looks like. You need to see it visually. With this approach, it's visually. Everyone in the team can do the maintenance. It's clear, you know the product. This is how it looked like, this is how it looks today. This is the difference, it saves a lot of time. Okay. I hope it, yes, yes please. Uh, hi, um, is it possible to check on anything other than uh, differences in pixels? As in, can you tell it to watch specifically for a particular configuration and always error on, uh, on that? I don't fully understand the question, but okay. I was just wondering, uh, let's say you have a, a very, uh, uh, you have a dynamic page, so you, want, you don't want a very strict uh, com image comparison, mm. yeah. uh, but you do want some sort of a way to uh, perhaps insert some sort of an element that if you see a particular little error icon or something, then even though it, it's not a very strict comparison, it should still always show as a failed test. Yeah. Can so I check for anything other than literal comparison between the two images? Yeah, so basically these, most of the tools that I'm talking about here are for visual validation and all of them, all of them in that list do a pixel to pixel comparison. You can decide not to do the whole page, you can decide to focus on certain parts of the page uh, when it comes to our tool, to Apple Tools Eyes, you can also validate at the layout level. So it's not 
sensitive to some, it can handle those dynamic, as I've shown in the example, dynamic pages, etc. cetera. Uh, and it would look for layout changes. Uh, but beyond that, if there is anything more strict that you can do, that you wanna do, you can always uh, check that in other means. You can augment the test in other ways that it would get you exactly where you want. Yep. Yes, sure. You can just, it's free forever just with minimal usage. Yeah. Uh, our tool, API Tools Eyes, is not open source. It's a commercial product. But all the other tools, WebDriver CSS is open source. You're free to try it. And, uh, it, it has all the features, just limited usage. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. For example, like I am running one of my Selenium tests on one machine, I will assume. So I have I can't hear you, sorry, can you speak up? Sorry. Hello, it's yes. fine, right? Yeah. I'm running one of my tests and in one of the my machine. So I have a base screenshot. So, and also tomorrow I'm running the same scenario. I'm capturing the same homepage in another, in another machine kind of thing. So I have two screenshots now. So will it be same or the will it be validation will be failed because the screen resolution is changed. Okay. So but nothing has been changed apart from the screen resolution. Yes. So. If the screen resolution, meaning that you had a small uh, screen, screen and then a yes. big screen. Yes. So first of all, you shouldn't take a full screen, a full page uh, screenshot that covers the entire desktop. The right way to do it is to decide in your test what is the size of the window of the browser that you want to test in. And then even if it's on a bigger screen or a smaller screen, it would be consistent. As, a, as, a, as part of your test plan, you should decide what are the sizes that you want to test in. It's not like you throw it away and whatever happens happens. So no, for example. Th and, and I'll explain more. But in addition, uh, specifically for, uh, as you've seen with, uh, with WebDriver CSS in the demo, you actually specify those widths. And the tool would make sure that they would conform to that width. And so it's not arbitrary, uh, arbitrary matching. With Apply Tools Eyes, in addition, even if you don't specify it, it automatically detects the environment in which the test is running, the operating system, the screen resolution, and all of that, and it automatically creates a baseline for that specific environment. So it won't ever try to match by default a small screen resolution with a big one. It will have different buckets for each of those environments, and it automatically know with which to compare. Yeah, got it. Okay. How many other testers use it? Yes. Uh, it's not allowed manual testers to check with the wireframes. Yeah. So how can a manual tester use this tool? Okay. So we have specifically for Apple Tools Eyes, we have a, a, a browser extension that allows you when you're browsing a page to click on a button and it performs a visual validation on that page. This is one way to go. But the main way to work with the tool is to add it to your automation. That's the, the primary way to go. Now, the, way, the, the role that the manual testers play there in most companies is that the automation guys do a one-time effort to add validation points to the test. And they're done. They don't need to touch it anymore. All the maintenance process, looking at the baselines, approved, if approving them, is done by the manual testers. Now, instead of testing just a small portion of the system and spending a lot of time to do that, you can test the whole system on a huge amount of environments and spend a fraction of the effort that you used to do to test that small part. Because all you need to do is look just at changes. If there are no changes, you can free to do exploratory testing or other testing that you cannot automate, okay? And once you have seen a change, you only need to approve it once. You don't need to look at it again and again and again and again. So in most cases, it's the manual testers that actually activate the tool once the automation guys just added the validation points inside the test page. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I don't know how much time we have okay. left, but uh, I'm, I, I can stay in. Okay. In some cases, uh, there might be a slight difference uh, as uh, some kind of a watermarking uh, to say this is a test server and a prod server, those kind of stuff, right? 
in such cases can we reuse across the servers qa stage prod yeah yeah sure sure um there will be differences but in the baseline itself right if we take baseline for any one server can we reuse it across all three it depends how test uh, depends on your environment if it's a uh, if it's production data or not so if you can have an accounter that is the same and showing the same deterministic results in both environments it depends if if it's completely dynamic you sh you can test it with layout um and then again if it's the same data that just on different servers that it doesn't matter because still the page should render the same no sir there might be some differences right uh, for example the any one image might change saying that this is a test server that will always be available in a test server that may not be available in a stage or a prod yeah so in this case you can either ignore choose to ignore that image because you know it can be different or you can um, uh, test by layout Okay. Or you can do regression test on the staging or regression test on the production and then you will have consistent results there. Okay. Maybe just one more there. Uh, baseline so images, right? Uh, whether Apply tools will store our baseline images or we should have that in our... So it depends on how you deploy it. If it's in the cloud, it's our problem. If it's on-premise, it's your problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in the slides, I just looked that Apply Tool supports Appium as well. So is that for native mobile apps? Yes. So in that case, there are various uh, mobiles with different screen resolutions. So in that case, is it necessary for a baseline to be set up for every single device? Or can I group it and then have that one baseline for many of the other devices? So you can do both things. So many, many of the companies that work with us, they do have, because uh, the uh, mobile UI and UX, they invest so much effort in doing it right. They want to make sure that it looks exactly right in the right color and that everything is exactly the same. So they have a baseline for each environment and they use the automated maintenance that I've shown you to quickly accept and maintain it. There are other customers that do have a single baseline for a device that represents a category of similar devices and they use regression strict testing on that specific device and then just make sure by layout that the rest of them are okay. So it's a risk. On one hand, you have only one baseline image or one baseline for one device. On the other hand, you have less coverage because it won't be able to see if an icon changed with another icon that you didn't intend to because only it needs to see that there is an icon there, right? So it depends. You balance the what you want to achieve with how much you want to invest in. Okay, so the second approach would uh, result in many false positives, right? So it would be uh, advisable to go with the first approach, isn't it? To just um, have one baseline for each of us? Everyone makes his own, so I cannot say that this one or the other one. For, and me, myself, I prefer to go and be strict everywhere. Because the difference is that with strict, you can be a hundred close to 100% sure that if the tool tells you that it's okay, then it's okay. Uh, with layout, um, if the tool tells you that it's okay, then you know that there are no severe problems there. But there could be problems that the tool is not aimed to find it this way. So anyway, you, you cannot be certain that it's uh, okay. You still need to test it in other ways, exploratory, make sure that really um, nothing broke in these environments. But it, you still need to look or you take the risk, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm still available if anyone wants to. I'm available today and tomorrow, so I'll be happy to. Thank you.